all that candy's gone out there now. Ain't it? Oh no, it's, it's oh, still there waiting for you. <laughs> Blow your pockets up. I can tell you right now, I like both of them, and I didn't even taste them. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms 81, beginning at the first verse. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound a tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Mirabal. Hear, O oh my people, while I admonish you, O oh Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him, and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with the honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. Almost 20 years ago, I was given this book that I want to start teaching from. It said, York, Merry Christmas. I know how much you enjoy Max. I hope you've not purchased this one. If you have, you'll have two. <laughs> You're a very special friend. Thank you for your witness, and thank you for being my friend. Your brother, Jerry. Pointer. Pop, thank you for being my friend. Max starts this book entitled A Gentle Thunder. The essence of it, and I think where it's going, is a study of the Gospel of John. He begins with this statement, his voice and our choice. And in preparing the lesson, I was reminded of that term that John Case used to love to use called prevenient grace. That wooing of God's heart for his children that woo us back to him. To me, that's called a gentle thunder because he doesn't harm us. He just calls us. But the choice is ours to make. Do we listen to his voice and return to him or do we keep going on down another way? Max says, a good pilot does what it takes to get his passengers home. Those who fly a lot know the sound of, please buckle your seat belts, we are approaching turbulent weather. <clears throat> Max said, the flight attendant told us to take our seats because of this turbulence. It was a rowdy flight and folks were quick to, weren't too quick to respond. So she warned us with these words. The flight is about to get bumpy. For your own safety, take your seats. Most did. 
but a few didn't, so she changed her tone. Ladies and gentlemen, for your own good, please take your seats. <coughs> Max said, I thought everybody was seated, but apparently I was wrong because I heard this voice. This is Captain Brown, he advised. People have gotten hurt by going to the bathroom instead of staying in their seats. Let's be very clear about our responsibilities. My job is to get you through the storm. Your job is to do what I say. Now sit down and buckle up. <laughs> so about that time, the bathroom door opened and a red-faced fellow with a sheepish grin exited and took his seat. <laughs> Was the pilot wrong? Of course not. Good pilots do what it takes to get their passengers home. And so does God. Because he wants to take us all home. This isn't home. No. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I was going to sing that, but I'm running out of time. So. <laughs> If God sees you standing when you should be sitting, if God sees you at risk, if he sees you at risk rather than safe, how far do you want him to go in getting your attention? What if he moved you to another land as he did to Abraham? Can you imagine being told, pick up all that you have and go to this land that you have not known? What if he called you out of retirement like he did Moses? <clears throat> How about the voice of an angel or the bowel of a fish like Gideon and Jonah? How about a promotion like Daniel's or a demotion like Samson's? God does what it takes to get our attention. For all its peculiarities and unevenness, the Bible has a simple story, and here it is. God made man, man rejected God, and God won't give up until he wins him back. That's provenient grace that each of us is given from our Heavenly Father. He keeps wooing us back unto himself until he gets us all. God is as creative as he is relentless. The same hand that sent manna to Israel sent Uzziah to his death. The same hand that set the children free from Israel also sent them to captive Babylon. Both kind and stern our father is. Tender and tough. Faithfully firm. Patiently urgent. Eagerly tough. Softly shouting, gently thundering, gentle thunder. That's how the Apostle John saw Jesus. John's gospel has two themes, the voice of God and the choice of man. And since this book, Matt says, is based on John, you'll see the same tandem his voice and our choice. <clears throat> Jesus said very simply, I'm the bread that gives life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'll come back and take you with me. Jesus proclaiming, ever offering but never ever forcing you remember in John 5 6 he stood by the crippled man and he said do you want to be well you remember in John 9 35 standing face to face to the blind man he said do you believe in the son of man near the tomb of Lazarus he was searching the heart of Martha, and he says simply, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And he asked this question, Martha.
Father, do you believe this? And then that time when he stood before Pilate. You know, I've always said I really felt sorry for Pilate. He almost got it. He almost recognized Jesus for exactly who he was. And Jesus tested Pilate's motive with these simple words. Is that your own question? Or did others tell you about me? And you remember the question that Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Very simple. That question is as good today as over 2,000 years ago when he asked it. If he says to me, Yorkie, who do you say that I am? I'm going to respond that you're the son of God. And I bet my life on it. And if I'm wrong when I get home, so be it. But if I'm right, look at what awaits me. Don't you see it? He told his disciples. In John, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. Not just a room, a mansion. Think of that. He's prepared it for those who trust him as God's own son. Now, if he asked you, who do you say that he is, what answer do you give? It's your choice. It's God's word, but it's your choice. The first time John hears Jesus speak, Jesus asks a question of him. What are you looking for? Among Jesus' last words is yet another. Do you love me? You remember that three times? He asked that at the end of John. Remember when he said, feed my sheep? We're the sheep. And we've been feasting on what those disciples did. You see, they thought they had lost everything on that Friday. But on Sunday... They realized they had gained everything because everything that their Savior had told them was true. He said, I'll raise again on the third day, and he did, and appeared to over 500 people before he ascended to his Father. You remember what he did? They were out there fishing, out there fishing, and it caught nothing. Jesus knew they were discouraged and hungry, so he built a fire by the sea. A charcoal fire, it says. And he cooked fish and had bread. And he fed them. And he asked them three times, Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And my, did they feed. You know why? Because they knew right then how much Jesus Christ loved them. And they decided. God will whisper, <clears throat> he may shout, he will touch or tug, he'll take away our burdens, he'll even take away our blessings maybe. If there are a thousand steps between us and him, he'll take all but one. But he will leave the final one for us. <clears throat> the choice is ours. His goal is not to make us happy. His goal is to make us his own. Jesus said, in the world you'll have trouble, but be brave. Another translation says, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. How could Jesus speak with such authority? What gave him the right to take command? Simple. He, like the pilot, knows what we don't, and he can see what we can't. What did the pilot know when he was talking to those people? He knew how to fly the airplane. What did the pilot see? He saw storm clouds ahead. 
What does God know? He knows how to navigate history. What does God see? I think you get the message. God wants to get us home safely. Just think of him as our pilot. Think of yourself as his passenger. Consider this book that my brother gave me as in-flight reading. <coughs> and think twice before you get up to go to potty. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason you gave it to me. <laughs> this is the kind of a little introduction to the book that we're going to study with your permission. Once there was a man who dared God to speak. Burn the bush like you did for Moses, God, and I'll follow. Collapse the walls like you did for Joshua, God, and I'll fight. Still the waves like you did on Galilee, God, and I'll listen. And so the man sat by a bush near a wall close to the sea and waited for God to speak. And God heard the man, so God answered. He sent fire, not for a bush, but for a church. He brought down a wall, not of brick, but of sin. He stilled a storm, not of the sea, but of the soul. And God waited for the man to respond. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited. But because a man was looking at bushes, not hearts, bricks and not lives, seas and not souls, he decided that God had done nothing. Finally, the man looked to God and asked, Have you lost your power? And God looked at him and said, Have you lost your hearing? <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's a simple thing. He gave us this to go by. Written thousands of years ago. Everything in it, every archaeological dig that's ever been performed in the history of this world has never done anything to disprove anything in this book. But what does it take to believe and to trust it? It takes our simple choice. <coughs> I trust it. Every page, every word, and I know it's going to play out just the way he said it from Genesis to Revelation. And if he says he's preparing a place for me, I'm darn sure looking forward to it because it's going to be something. But until I get there, I trust his promise. I'll be with you even until the end of the age. <coughs> he's our Father in heaven who wants to see each of us make it safely home.